Okay, good morning and welcome to the public, to the committee's 28th meeting in 2018. Um, can I just say, could I ask everyone to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? And we have received apologies from John Finney and Stuart Stevenson. We're moving on to agenda item four, which is the Transport Scotland Bill, and we're going to have two panels. The first panel um, is, is going to talk, uh, but before they do, I want to just check with any members. Does anyone have any interests they want to declare? No? Okay, fine. This is our fifth evidence session on the Transport Bill Scotland, and as I said, we're taking it on two, with two panels. The first will look at the proposals in the bill on double and pavement parking, um, and the committee will then take evidence on the proposals relating to roadworks. Uh, the like to welcome Stuart Hay, the director of Living Street Scotland. I'd like to also welcome John Lauder, the national director of Sustrans Scotland, Ian Smith, policy and public affairs officer for Inclusion Scotland, and David Hunter, a member for the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland. Now, um, I'm sure you're all well versed in how the committee works, but you don't need to push any of the buttons. What I will do is I will call you in, and the gentleman on your left will make your microphone live, so you, you don't need to do anything. I, I try and warn people that if I'm waggling my pen, um, the, the faster it waggles, it means that you are really pushing to the end of your time, and I'd like you to, to wrap up um, uh, <laughs> relatively quickly. That will allow me to get everyone to come in which is very important. So bearing that in mind, uh, the first question is from John Mason. John. Uh, thanks very much, convener. And uh, obviously we are starting on uh, pavement parking and so on, which uh, I find an interesting subject. Um, so my first question, I suppose, is, well, do you broadly agree with what the bill's proposing? Um, but linked to that, do you think it will actually happen? Because last week, the committee, some of us were in Glasgow, in Union Street, which is one of the main streets in Glasgow. There's double yellow lines, and there was vehicles parked in the double yellow lines. So it's one thing setting out something in the law, but it's another thing actually happening. And so do you think this proposed ban on pavement parking would actually happen even if it was put into the law? But primarily, do you agree it should be put into the law? Who'd like to start off on that? Uh, Stuart? Uh, thank, thank you for that question. Um, yes, uh, to, uh, it's, it's very welcome. It's, it's necessary. Councils need these powers because people that we, we hear from talk about the impacts on their lives in terms of access. And I'm sure some of the other panellists will, will talk about that. There's also issues about the damage that's done to pavements. In terms, they're not designed for, designed for vehicles. I think it will, it will work where it needs to work, where, there is the, where the case is made by communities to get enforcement that then enforcement, enforcement will, will happen. I think the biggest change will be through behaviour change, and I, I, I really welcome the government's commitment to a behaviour change campaign, a publicity campaign behind it. So enforcement's part of it, and we do need to enforce, um, improve enforcement on all sorts of areas of parking uh, and traffic law in our urban centres. David, you want to come in there? Oh, um, thank you. Uh, yes, I certainly endorse what, what Stuart said. Uh, yes, it is needed. I mean, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, there have been uh, calls for this for, for years, decades possibly, from disability organisations as well as pedestrian organisations, um, because pavement parking does cause a real problem for a lot of disabled people, blind people, people in wheelchairs, anybody really with a mobility difficulty uh, is frequently disadvantaged by pavement parking. Um, so... The key test on it really is about enforcement. Is it going to be enforceable? And I think our position really is that we think that would be strengthened by having the minimum possible um, ex exemptions or exceptions from the bill, uh, from the provision, so that if an attendant sees a car on a pavement, um, they know basically that they, they can ticket it. Um, there are also, we'd also welcome the provisions um, for camera enforcement in the bill. Um, which, uh, given that there's, I think, about a dozen local authorities that still have decriminalised parking, uh, don't have decriminalised parking enforcement, so that it could uh, enforce there. But we particularly would like to see the, the exceptions for um, loading and also bin collections, bin lorries, waste collections, removed from the bill. Ian. 
Conclusion, Scotland. Uh, welcomes the principles behind the, 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 the bill today. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I happened to, as it happens this morning, bump into Ross Finney uh, downstairs. Uh, and he brought in the first member's bill on this many years ago into the Scottish Parliament. So I'm sure he's as delighted as I am to see that it's now finally in a government bill and therefore has a, a chance of getting forward. So we welcome it. It's very important for disabled people, as has been said. It's actually about their rights. It's about their being able to get out of their house to where they want to go safely on pavements, um, where at moments many are actually literally trapped in their house because vehicles parked on the pavements means they can't get out on a wheelchair or they have other mobility payments, um, impairments. If they have visual impairments, um, vehicles parked on footpaths can be a, d a danger to them. So it is actually about their rights to be participate fully in society uh, and therefore we welcome the bill. One area we are concerned about, however, is that the bill does not include the provisions that the previous member's bill had in relation to banning parking adjacent to drop curbs and we'd like the committee to consider that. One of my colleagues will ask sure. about that one. Uh, you mentioned about enforcement. I think that is crucial, and I think I'm sure we'll discuss that further in the course of the, the morning. Um, but if there isn't effective enforcement, then it isn't worth the paper it's written on, and it will be up to local authorities uh, to work with their local communities to ensure that these provisions, if they're enacted, are properly implemented and enforced. John, you get a chance because everyone else is coming. I know, <laughs> and there's always a danger going last that you just repeat everything that the people, your colleagues have said. So I, I, I totally agree with my colleagues and everything that they've said. I don't think this will be like turning on a switch. We're not instantly going to solve the problem of parking on the pavement because it's become a societal norm over the past few years. And in Scotland, over the past 10 years, car ownership has risen, and yet access to a car has not. So more of us are three or even four car families, and that's becoming more normal. And that means there are more cars around looking for parking spaces. So this is an issue that's become a societal norm. It will take time to change it. It won't just be changed by addressing the law, as you've said, um, Mr Mason, because we have a very, I think, woolly approach to parking enforcement in Scotland at the moment. It's not always clear and it can vary local authority to local authority. So there's also an element of changing our behaviours, and that takes time. But we strongly support and we welcome the fact that this element is in the bill because it does address, as people have said, a human issue, a human need to make it easy for people to get out of their house and get down the pavement where they live unencumbered. Right, I have a, quite a major route in my constituency and... Um, it's reasonably wide road with reasonably wide pavement, so, but the, it's, it's got buses on it as well, which I would guess help disabled people and others. Now, I think in order to keep the buses and the traffic moving so that there's two clear lanes for traffic, the council has painted white lines at the side, which in, strongly encourages cars to put two wheels on the pavement. Now, that still leaves 1.5 metres, I would suggest, eh, for people to get past. So I think that road works, I have to say. There's plenty of room on the road for two large vehicles to pass. There's room for vehicles to park outside their houses. And there's room for uh, pedestrians with or without wheelchairs, etc., uh, to get past between the car and the hedge. So I just feel, I mean, if that is working, if that system is working, are we not causing more problems? By forcing the cars fully onto the road, does that not slow down the buses? Does it not slow down the fire engines? You know, do, are we not just going to create more problems for ourselves? So I think what you're talking about there is, is exactly the type of street that could be exempted via the bill. Uh, we are comfortable with the provision for doing that. That's, it's, it's locally led, so you can look at the type of street, you can look at the provisions, and you can look at the impacts on people with disabilities. And I, I think that's the key to it. You can create that type of facility by putting a line on the pavement, provided there's, a, there's sufficient access for people to use, 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 use the pavement. And if, that's, if there's a justification for that, then councils can do that under the bill. Uh, what it does in the bill is it makes that process an awful lot simpler uh, in, in terms of the pr procedures they have to have to go through. Um, so I think the bill is just a more efficient way of managing parking. Does anyone else disagree with that, David? Uh, no, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, I mean, Max has um, kind of slightly reluctantly, I think, um, accepts that there's a case for local authorities to make decisions on local circumstances if the kind of situation you, you describe you know basically the pavement parking isn't a problem it doesn't actually um, 
cause problems particularly for disabled people or for other people basically if it works um, you know I think that there is a case for, for local local decisions being made on local circumstances so we don't accept to the, we don't object to that provision in the bill um, so long as there's a proper kind of equality impact assessment on, on, on the, the circumstances what we are concerned about and, and you know, uh, object to is the blanket exemption for, for loading and for bin lorries in particular that would apply everywhere. We're going to come on to that. about loading. I'm just more specifically on the cars. Can One I, more. Yeah, yeah can I, I bring go, Jamie in and then come back to you? Jamie, you had a small... Thank, thank you, Convener. Good, good morning, panel. Uh, and this is a fascinating discussion. And, and the, the good news is I think there's cross-party support for the, the essence of what the bill is trying to achieve. However, there are concerns that have been shared uh, to us uh, locally uh, 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 as as members, and one of those is that by simply banning the parking on pavements, and I don't mean full four wheel parking, in m many or most cases uh, one could argue it's two wheel parking that, that occurs in many of our local streets. Um, but we're not reducing the number of cars that are in a household, nor are we making any additional parking spaces or facilities available to people i mean it's a quite simple question is where do these cars go where where do you think they're going to go um isn't it the case at the moment that some elderly or, or people with mobility issues quite like to be able to park outside their house to save them having to walk many streets away where there may or may not be an exemption so my issues are around displacement here are we could could an unintended consequence of this be that we create a huge traffic issues in, in small communities Ian, I think you want to come I think there's an important equalities issue here, and uh, it's, it shouldn't we shouldn't be creating conflicts between uh, vehicles and pedestrians, and between disabled people uh, and non-disabled people in terms of uh, road management. And it's important that when looking at car parking, you actually don't just look at where cars can park, but actually look at the whole access issues and ensure there's proper quality impact assessments of any decisions that are taken. Now, the problem with vehicles parking on footpaths is if the footpath isn't wide enough, uh, like the case that Mr Mason was referring to earlier, uh, then that actually blocks access to the footpath for pedestrians. And why should pedestrians be treated less favourably than just, motorists? And, and just to, so just I think it's important yeah. thing is to get the balance right. Uh, and it is actually a responsibility, I think, of local authorities, not just to say, well, cars have to park here because there's nowhere else to park, but actually to look at how yeah. they deal with the shortage of car parking in communities, uh, work with the local communities about where cars can, can safely park and ensure that the access for disabled people, uh, 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 mothers with push chairs, elderly people with mobility problems mm. um, are resolved. One other issue is, is that vehicles parking on footpaths can damage footpaths and that can create, in the, even if the vehicle isn't there, the footpath may be broken and that may actually cause trip hazards, etc., sure. for people with visual impairments or mobility impairments. Uh, may make it difficult for a wheelchair to pass. So there are a number of issues about vehicles parking on footpaths which are quality issues and need to be taken in that uh, account I, in that can, way. can I just uh, come back? Just I know it's not my question uh, session, but I, there's no question uh, that, uh, of anyone uh, um, around the equalities aspect of access to pavements. Uh, so that, that's not the intention of my question. My question is a simple one, is th the vehicles are not going to disappear. Um, so, you know, there's nothing in the bill that makes any provision for facilities to be made available to people. So perhaps if anyone else is answering that, they may like to, to contemplate that. S Stuart, I'll bring you in briefly and then I'd like to come back to John. Well, we've suggested in our evidence that local authorities should have a parking strategy. I think th this problem has built up over 40 years and we need to manage it and we need to be creative about how we do that. There is probably workplaces and evenings that have empty car parks right next to very congested streets. So could we use that type of space? And generally just looking at car ownership um, and in general and new models of car ownership such as car clubs and that side of things. In areas with real pressure in city centres, that's where you, car clubs can really come into their own. Uh, and removing parking would incentivise some people that probably don't use their car very often. It might actually benefit, but while you've got a car, you won't join a car club. So it's, it's changing our mobility profile. John. Thanks. Uh, so just really one final point. I mean, balance was mentioned in there, I think, by Mr Smith, which I totally agree with. Do you think the, the process for exempting streets, which councils would be able to do, strikes the right balance? I mean, is that going to cover the right streets? I mean, I th we got the impression that Edinburgh didn't sound like it was going to do very many, <coughs> and there will be a cost and there'll be a hassle for the councils. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there's a, a right balance in here? Ian. I think it depends on the 
regulations and directions that uh, Scottish Government Ministers give under the terms of the, the Bill. I think if the directions are very clear that exemptions, need, there needs to be a positive case to be made for an exemption rather than you have to make a case against an exemption, uh, I think that, that will help. Uh, but one of the key aspects of that is there has to be proper involvement, engagement with the local community. Uh, there has to be proper look at the equality impact uh, 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 issues re relating to and any exemptions uh, and that the access particularly for disabled people and uh, others who um, may find difficulty and if cars are parked on the pavement is properly taken into account before an exemption order is made but the onus should be on a positive case having to be made mm. as to why an exemption is needed in a particular case uh, and they should be kept to a minimum um, okay as, as we're on exemptions <coughs> it leads neatly on to mike's question mike convener good morning panel um, I want to focus on one specific exemption in the bill, uh, which is a concern, I think, over the proposed 20-minute <coughs> exemption for pavement parking for loading and unloading for businesses and major vehicles. Um, I mean, at the, you'll be aware at the moment the law says you may not drive on pavements, simple as that, but we know it happens. What we're doing with this bill is actually giving a legal basis for people to do just that because you've got to drive onto the pavement to do it. So um, what are your thoughts on this 20-minute exemption? I mean, one of my th thoughts is that if, if we say in the bill there's a 20-minute exemption, that may very well become the norm rather than the exception. Any, any views on that? David, do you want to go on that? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I completely agree, agree with you. I, I think there's a, a kind of real con contradiction that this, this bill would actually reinforce as, as it's drafted between the fact that to drive on a pavement is illegal but to park on it for 20 minutes would be legal. So I think the principle um, we'd really like to see is that pavement parking is not allowed uh, unless there are exceptional circumstances and I'd also endorse what other people have already said about creating that culture where it's actually seen as antisocial to park on a pavement and I think to allow people to park on a pavement for 20 minutes um, would would really run counter to that and really undermine that creation of a culture um, that you know it is not th a, a, a decent thing to do to park on the pavement because it does cause pedestrians problems um, so because of that we don't think there should be any exemption for loading whatsoever um, we think that it will create real enforcement problems for parking attendants and we think it will actually mean that parking attendants will only ticket vehicles that they know have been there for some time, not 20 minutes, but probably a couple of hours by the time they go back and they, they pass the vehicle and they note that it was there before. So th they will actually pass um, pavement park vehicles, uh, particularly in town centres and, and, and areas, uh, because the loading... Uh, as you say, it's about loading. It's not just about delivery vehicles. You know, pe people going into the shops to, to to collect some goods could construe that could say that they're loading. Um, we think that many <coughs> tickets issued will be appealed on the basis that people say that they were loading. So the simplest thing to do, uh, the, the clear and simple position, is not to permit loading uh, throughout throughout the country. Distinguishing that from the kind of question of exempting particular areas. Um, does anyone want to follow up, up on that? I can go on then to another question. <clears throat> Is there a compromise here? I know you were saying, David, that you wouldn't agree with it at all, but I'm always looking for a, a balance here. Um, I know in written evidence, Stuart, your organisation have suggested that it might be acceptable if there's a, if there's a gap, say, of a one and a half metres for disabled, for pedestrians, for people who, who use our are pavements is 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 the solution rather than David suggests a total ban and, and removal from this of the bill, or is there a compromise, as you suggest, Stuart, perhaps where there's a, a there's a one and a half meter gap, and if there is, how would that be enforced? <coughs> yes, um, so that that I think the simplest way is to remove the clause, but if the, the committee felt embarrassed they weren't going to do that, I think that, that there is another option. I think this is an overarching, overarching clause about obstruction, uh, which could be defined in, in, in guidance. Uh, and part of the problem with existing laws is obstruction is not very well defined. So the police do have powers on that. They never use them. And it would be getting around that that we, we could say, right, whatever you, you cannot 
obstruct pavements and then it's down to the, the driver to make a, make a value judgment on whether they are or not and for the enforcement person to come along and do a simple measurement and say well actually you can't get a wheelchair past there so this person's broken the law and I think that could work fairly easily if we get if we get the law right and, and say obstruction is not allowed and we get the guidance right that says this is what it looks like I think that could work as, as, as a potential compromise. Mm -hmm. Can I, can I just ask, just to, to bear in mind a real-life example, every morning when I come into the Parliament at about 7 o'clock, there is a lorry double parked which unloads everything onto the pavement. Um, it doesn't obstruct the pavement, it just put well, it doesn't obstruct it physically, it just obstructs it with all the crates and cages and mm -hmm. food and waste that's going out, and it's a transfer process. Surely if we don't allow something, would you not believe that it would just create a different problem which isn't covered by the legislation? Um, does anyone want to comment on that, John? Well, it, related to that, I think is that is and and to Mr. Green's point is that we've we've not thought about how we design in our our streets for 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 years really, and I think the redesign of streets is really important. Loading bays, for example, might be an easier way for a parking enforcement officer to police a loading bay so that somebody doesn't double park in the loading bay and therefore forces commercial vehicles onto the pavement or to double park. Now, where we have, where Sustrans comes in, I suppose, is in placemaking and construction and design, and where we have worked with communities. We've got a great example in Dumfries where we worked with a, a long, narrow Edwardian street where there was a lot of double parking, parking on the pavement, and we worked with the residents of the street in conjunction with Dumfries and Galloway's housing department. The, it was the residents who came up with a brilliant solution to the parking issue and re we've redesigned the street and it works much better now and that's because people applied a bit of thinking to how the street would function and built in loading bays and it, it seems to me that a designated area for a commercial vehicle to stop and unload in a street or in an area would be much better and easier to enforce than an exemption so i think i think we need to spend a bit of time thinking about that and how we deliver how we deliver within the urban realm. We have, we've not thought about that at all. And as internet shopping has grown, we've, we've given absolutely no thought to that at all. And I think we could, we could learn quite a bit from our northern European neighbours who do this much better and do this in a much more planned way. And it goes back to the parking strategy point that uh, Stuart mentioned. Um, a small yeah. follow-up, and then I'd like to move on to the next question. I, from asked, I, I asked the bill team where the 20 minutes came from. And their their reaction was well, it just it was just it just appeared. There's, there doesn't seem to be any scientific basis for putting a 20 minute uh, allowance in the bill. So if the if if that section wasn't removed at stage two or three, uh, what would you feel about reducing the 20 minutes to say a lesser amount? And what should that be from your perspective? Who'd like it? David, do you want to do something? Well, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, you know, I think any any limit, um, t 20 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, gives a parking attendant a, a difficult job. I think they should be able to ticket a, a vehicle when they see it pavement parked. And similarly, I, I must, I, I don't entirely agree with with Stuart about the kind of 1.5 metre. Um, obstruction issue again I think realistically in practice going back to the enforcement question the very first one I think you need to make it as simple as possible to enforce which really means um, pavement parking is not permitted except in exceptional circumstances I'm, I'm going to have to move on just relevant of the time uh, Maureen I think yours is the next question uh, thank you convener morning panel um, I'd like to uh, focus on dropped car curbs we've had several witnesses who have called um, for the bill to prohibit parking in front of dropped kerbs and as a constituency member I've certainly had the um, calls for this in relation to motability vehicles and wheelchairs but also um, dropped kerbs in terms um, of, of cyclists so can I ask what your view is on, on this proposal but more importantly I think how could this uh, uh, how could it work in practice Okay, so I I Ian was waiting to come in on the last question, which I excluded him from, for which I apologise, but you can have the first chance on this one. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, yes, well, the drop curves are, are actually essential for people with mobility problems. They actually enable people with wheelchairs or other mobility problems to actually cross roads, without which they, they are trapped. Uh, in, 
preparing our evidence for the previous Members' Bill uh, in the par last Parliament, we asked uh, members for examples of it, and some of the cases came back were things like um, cars were parked across the drop, cars meant I had to go round the block to get find somewhere where I could actually cross the road, and I missed a doctor's appointment. It's actually that important. It actually stops people getting from to where they need to be. Uh, at the end of the day, it actually stops people getting out of their house because if they, if they haven't got confidence that uh, they can get to where they want to be, and then they will not go out, and that causes social isolation and other other problems. Um, and uh, you know, there may be, there may well be buses which to help disabled people, but if they can't actually get to them because the drop curbs are blocked, they're not much use to them. Um, so I think there are huge issues about drop curbs um, that need to be addressed. I don't understand why the government dropped this from the bill. Um, there's some talk about them bringing it through as secondary legislation. It doesn't seem to make sense to me. There should be a blanket ban on parking on drop curbs. Uh, with the option for local authorities to make exemptions if they can make a strong case why an exemption should be made in a particular case. Um, that would be the way to do it, and it's better done through primary legislation where it's clear, along with parking and pavements, that that uh, is not acceptable. I, I just see you all nodding your heads. So <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm assuming you all agree. Maureen? <coughs> so would you paint double yellow lines in front of them, or, or would you just have it like in, legis in your... Well, uh, Highway code or whatever, That's knowing that you shouldn't park in well, uh, front of a drop curb. I, th I, th I think if it's, um, I mean, if, for example, uh, bus bus stops, you're not allowed to park in bus stops, and that's mm -hmm. just a general provision. You don't, um, okay, you have to mark it as a bus stop, but um, it's fairly obvious if a curb is dropped that it's a, it's a drop curb. And uh, if the law says you cannot park in front of a drop curb, you cannot park in front of a drop curb. You don't need any further markings to, to designate it. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, the next question, then, uh, I think, is Richard. Richard Lam. Yes, thank you, con convener. Um, my question is mainly to Stuart Hay, but two other members of the panel may want to come in, um, of Living Street, Scotland. In written evidence, you asked for clarity as to which pedestrian areas are covered by the proposed prohibition. Can you explain why the current definition is not sufficiently robust and how this could be rectified? Yeah, um, we were involved in the previous um, members bill and it was there's a lot of debate about that that aspect of defining things um, and I think I think using the talking about footways is good uh, and very clear and it refers to a pre, a, another act uh, but there is lots of different types of path and we think the bill captures all those different types of path Certainly, we've, I've had a debate with uh, my colleague from Sustrans here about whether we actually it does actually capture all of them. So I think it's just a question that we're posing that make this very very clear for motorists and very clear for um, enforcement that every every area of where people either walk or cycle on is is covered. Yeah, that's the point you're making. Is enforcement bus lanes and loading bays should park in them? but we go by and we see people parked in them. How frustrating is that? Pedestrian areas, I could mention quite a number of pedestrian areas where I've seen cars coming down or even lorries coming down to deliver. Um, you know, none of us have been maybe possibly lo lo uh, driving lorries, but people have to deliver stuff to shops, and some of them are located within pedestrian areas. So what do we do about that? Does it really come down to the point that my colleague made John, uh, uh, about the factor of uh, being enforced. You know, there's no enforcement. Or if we pass a law, it's got to be enforced. Or is it not a case that laws, people just accept a law and, and obey the law and we don't need to enforce it? I think there's a bit of both, to be honest. I think there is, there is an accept, this has become an acceptable behaviour for some people, not everybody, but, and that needs to change because people need to realise the impacts that, that, that this has and then you do need a fallback of some sort of enforcement and some councils are better geared up to do that than others in terms of they have a good regime in place that they can gear up for this bill and other places they're going to have to think quite creatively and they may have to borrow some of the capacity from neighbouring local authorities to do this and I think what will happen actually is it will be specific streets with a specific issue where the communities get got real concerns and there'll be a blitz and then the problem will go away it will not be uh, an inspection on every street all the time. Uh, it's just not going to go go that way, but we do need the ability where there's real, real problems to send a team out 
and ho hopefully you can you can maybe give people warnings in advance of that saying you realize that, the, that we will be around and it, it might not come to the point where you actually dish out fines but it's, there will be a hard co core of people who just don't get this that this behavior is unacceptable uh, that will need to be tackled via the via enforcement John, you yeah just two things I think Buchanan Street is a really good example of where you can mix early in the morning, lots of delivery vehicles, lots of trades vehicles, and yet the rest of the day, it's a, a wonderful experience to be a pedestrian. So I think with good control, that can work really well. The topic, thanks Stuart for reminding me, that I'm not clear about, and I think I would like the committee to think about this, is increasingly in urban Scotland, we want to see... Um, provision for segregated cycle lanes, so physically removed from the footway, usually by a, a small angled drop kerb, and then a, a wide uh, cycle lane, then a drop, and then to parking. I'm not clear in the bill, and Stuart and I aren't, aren't clear between us, whether it, parking on a cycle lane will be uh, prohibited. So I wonder if we could have a check on that, because that's the way we're going. Um, there's a, a good, a, a good uh, demonstration project in Glasgow at the moment on Victoria Road, which will link Queen's Park to the Merchant City. But we have uh, projects like that in now five cities in Scotland. It's very much following the Copenhagen style of how you allow people to get around and you, you don't mix cycling and pedestrians. So I really would like just to check on that because uh, we're, we're not entirely clear whether that, that would be prohibited uh, in, in the bill. Okay. The the next question then is uh, Colin. I think you've probably just answered my question, which is around cyclists and whether the bill currently goes far enough to to, 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 to protect cyclists. And what you're saying is it's not clear from the bill whether or not um, a ban on cycle paths um, is, 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 is is basically being proposed. Right. It, it's not clear to me whether that is covered in the provision. It's just a, it's a technicality, really. I think the spirit of it would be you shouldn't. But it's whether technically you you can. So that's and and you know um, there's a great example uh, of one of the very early lanes in Edinburgh where uh, people did park in it for one day. The evening news ran a big story about it. It's never happened again because people just got used to the social norm. All oh, right, that's what it's for. Fine, I get it now. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm not entirely clear, and I think also uh, double parking is a real issue for anybody that wants to get around on a bicycle because you're then pitching yourself right out into oncoming traffic and whatever. So that, that one element needs to be tightened. The other element, which I'm more sanguine about, is where you may have a vehicle parked for maintenance on a designated cycle way in terms of a mixed-use path, might be a former railway line that's used as a greenway. I think there, uh, with some exemptions, I'm sure that could be managed. It, it manage it, we manage it at the moment fairly well, if it's a maintenance or a service vehicle rather than a member of the public parking. Okay. Next question. Uh, one of the points I picked up is there was a suggestion, uh, I think, rem sort of remote suggestion that you try and de-conflict loading and unloading to times when there weren't pedestrians on, on the street, which means, you know, probably an early start for some people. I, I know it's been tried, and, and I, I hear lots of complaints from people who, who object to their bins being emptied at six o'clock in the morning because they're trying to get an extra 10 minutes sleep but i mean are you suggesting that lorries should be encouraged to deliver say in in the period six to seven thirty before the main build-up of traffic sorry was that your suggestion yeah th yes i think it is and i think that you know there are there are good examples on the continent of of large towns and small cities that function perfectly normally where they control when deliveries can take place and when they can't i don't really see a reason why we can't do that. I'm not suggesting it would be blanket, but I think in some places it will work well. And I, I, I go back to the Buchanan Street example, which I think seems to work particularly well. Does anyone else have a view on that? Does Or, or maybe we move Colin straight on then to your your question, your next question. Uh, just a follow-up to the, the comment John made earlier. John raised the, the, the project in Dumfries, I suppose, to declare an interest as, as a local councillor and, and, and chair of the committee at that time. But what that, that, that project did, and I'm biased, that was a great project, but what that project did is it focused 
attention on the need to look again at the whole layout of streets to, to, to better balance cars and pedestrians and cyclists. Do you think this bill will act as an incentive to do that, or is there anything else that needs to be put into the bill to strengthen the need to start to look again at the whole balance when it does come to in public realm improvements such as that, that project in Dumfries? Thank you. Uh, I think it will focus attention on it. I think it needs to, and to Mr Green's point, where you've got high car ownership and maybe a narrow street, it's exactly the type of project that needs that local authorities need to kind of adopt and, and roll out. I don't think it'll happen. I mean, my understanding from Edinburgh City Council is anecdotally they have done analysis where they think there'll be a particular area, and I, I, can't, I haven't got an exact figure, but they reckoned it was a fairly small number of streets where they would have to put in some intervention. I think it's a great example of the type of project that should be done, could be done. Um, I think this bill will lead to that. It will lead us all to think about how we park our cars, those of us who own them, uh, and the impact it has on those who don't have access to a car. So I, I do welcome it, and I think we will see a gradual change. So we'll see more projects like Queen Street, I think, as we go ahead. Do you want to follow? OK, uh, Jamie, I think the next question is yours, Jamie. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, just, uh, it's been a very inter interesting discussion. A few things have jumped out at me. Can I just check if, we, if we're confident, or the panel's confident, that this lumping together of pavement parking and double parking is the best way to approach the issues, especially around things like deliveries um, uh, or, or dropping off goods at people's homes, etc., uh, where the tendency may be to double park rather than, than pavement park, which I think we all agree is unacceptable. Um, uh, it, do you think this, uh, by, uh, and indeed if, if the suggestion is that we include drop parking as well, that the three are all treated the same or should, that, should we treat them as, as separate um, occurrences that can be dealt with differently, that the bill doesn't do that at the moment? Um, David, yeah, sorry. Um, well, I think from Max's point of view, it's really pavement parking that we're, we're concerned with. Um, so, um, Double parking clearly causes a number of problems, cyclists, buses, car drivers, all, all sorts of things, but those aren't really the problems that affect disabled people. So if, um, uh, in terms of the double, double parking, so if the, the, a better pavement parking ban was achieved as a result of separating provisions for double parking and pavement parking, I think we'd probably live with that. My colleagues to my left might might not be so happy with that. But um, it's re really a, a pavement parking that we want a, a kind of really firm, clear line for everyone to create that culture um, and that easy enforcement environment that's obviously been a bit of a theme of the discussion so far. Thank you. Ian, do you want to come back to that? Because it looked like you, you smiled <laughs> when he said I, you might disagree. Um, it's only a slight disagreement. I mean, our, our focus is particularly on the uh, pavement parking and drop cars because that is the big issues that affect mobility and, and equality for disabled people. But there are issues that, uh, you know, a car, vehicles are double parked, they do cause additional uh, issues in relation to road safety for pedestrians trying to cross roads and things. So that's an issue which also impacts on disabled people. You know, if you get past one car parked, uh, you might then find another car parked in front of you so you can't get around that one. So uh, there are issues about that as well. Richard, you wanted to come in? On pavement parking, John Lauder said that he sat down with a council and he decided with the, the residents. So should it just be the council who should say, right, OK, you can't park there or double park or, or, or put your, your yeah. uh, do pavement parking? Or should also the, be encouraged that residents can approach the council? What sort of mechanism could, could, that, could be set up to do that? Yeah. So John wants to come in. Ian and then Stuart. That particular project, which was in Collins constituency, was a particular street where there was a real problem with parking and also rat running uh, cars. A really difficult street to cross. A lot of elderly people living in the street felt quite intimidated, really, and just preferred to stay in than go out. Um, either they couldn't get down the pavement or they couldn't get across the road, and there was a particular crossroads on it. So it was one of those streets, and I think there'll be a few of them in each town, that was acknowledged as a real issue. And it was the council who raised it, but it was the residents who we worked with as a kind of bridge between the residents and the local authority. And we got to a point where we had a, a, a pragmatic design that everybody could live with and were happy with, and it was then delivered. And I don't think that would need to happen in every street in Scotland, but I think there will be some streets where that's a great approach. 
because where you get everyone on the street and I would say 90% of the people in the street bought into the project um, and are now very happy with it. In fact, it, it, the, the, the residents have now formed themselves into into their own um, development association and they're, they're, they're greening va vacant and derelict land and doing other things. However, what it's done is it's brought people together, it's created a sense of neighbourliness and it's solved the issue. So I do think it's a really good project. It wasn't an expensive project because it wasn't infrastructure led. It wasn't all about let's redesign things and it didn't come from the council telling residents how things should be. It was very much the residents saying we're part of this design and we'll work with you and it took about a year of discussions before anything was built and at the end of that it's worked and it's worked really well. So I hope that's answered your question. I, I think, as I say, I don't think it needs to happen and it, no, it wouldn't have to happen on every street but on streets that are really tight and difficult but with parking, with the narrowness, it was a great approach and it has redistributed parking within the street itself. People found space that was poorly designed and badly used and we've rearranged it to work really effectively now. Yeah, and one of the four outcomes in the accessible transport framework is that disabled people are involved in the design, development and improvement of transport policies, services and infrastructure. And Inclusion Scotland would certainly argue that if disabled people are, are involved uh, in designing it, then you get it right for disabled people, you get it right for everybody. But we, that, that principle should extend to the community because if you work with the community as a whole in developing and designing your problems, identifying what the issues are in terms of bad parking, finding where alternative parking might be available, for example, you're more likely to get community buy-in and therefore make it easier for it to be enforced because the community itself will enforce it. So it's important to involve the community, not the top-down approach, but a community up approach. Okay. Stuart, you want to Yes, I'd, I'd echo Ian's point and I think the the way the bill's designed it allows it to do that. It, it, it's What we don't want to see is local authorities just deciding to put exempt, blanket exemptions but where they think it's too difficult. I think it's for the community to come forward and say, we've got a real problem in our street with this, with the impacts of, of this. Can we exempt it or can we redesign our street to exempt it? It then goes to the committees of the council to come up with a solution and pass a solution. And that might be signing a line in that street or it might be something more creative. So the bill allows that to happen. Okay, Jamie, sorry, do you want to thank come you. back to um, the next question? Uh, thank you. Uh, can I ask the panel, is there anything that's fundamentally missing from the bill? Uh, I appreciate there are areas that you may want to tweak or change uh, in the current provisions of the bill, but is there something that you think is substantively uh, has been overlooked by, by the bill team? Um, this could end up with a huge shopping list. So while you're gathering your thoughts, could I try and encourage you to try and limit it to, to one or two points? Because I, I'm sure you'll each have one of those. Um, Stuart, do you want to start that off? Well, there's, there's two issues uh, school zigzags at the moment councils need to put an order down to make them legally enforceable and we think they should just be nationally enforceable and the second is the point about local authorities having some sort of parking strategy and that could be quite light touch but to say you need to think about these issues uh, uh, and come up with a strategy okay john i've made the point about cycle lanes beside beside the pavement i think that needs to be checked and i'll restrict myself to that Okay, Ian. I've mentioned the accessible transport framework um, earlier, but that was uh, co-designed by disabled people, disabled people's organisations, and uh, other uh, trans transport providers, transport authorities, uh, by, and published by the Scottish Government in 2016. Its overarching framework is that all disabled people can travel with the same freedom, choice, dignity, and opportunity as other citizens. We think it's a missed opportunity not to have made reference to that within this transport bill, uh, and we wish it was there. Um, Okay, David. Um, I would uh, totally agree with what, what Ian's just said. I've got a copy of the framework work here. Um, Max really just confined itself to, to commenting on what was in the bill um, rather than what wasn't. But um, clearly there, there's a long-term issue about making travel, transport and mobility much more inclusive for disabled people that isn't right at the moment. Okay, uh, Deputy Convener, Gail Ross got the next question. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. I'm going to touch on the equality impact assessment and whether you think that it has covered everything. The policy uh, memorandum states that it has not identified any group that would be adversely affected by this new legislation. Do you agree with that statement? Oh, who'd like to head off on that? Um, Ian, you're not looking away, so you can go first. <laughs> I think provided the regulations, directions and guidance from ministers in relation to the uh, footway parking, 
um, are sufficiently robust and ensure that disabled people are involved in the design uh, and discussion on, on all aspects of exemptions within the, the, the Act, then I think that will not have a, an adverse impact on, on disabled people. Um, some of the other provisions of the bill could have a positive impact for disabled people, um, for example, in bus services. Um, if, uh, again, if disabled people are involved in, in those discussions, we, and local authorities can enforce better training of uh, disability awareness training for bus drivers, uh, for example, and ensure that people are properly consulted before routes are removed, uh, because the impact it could have on, uh, on disabled people's ability to get to places they need to go to. So I think there are potential, potential there, again, subject to the regulations and directions that Scottish ministers may give. But the, so the, the bill has the power to improve things significantly for disabled people, but it's subject to how it's implemented. Does anyone else want to come in? You were all looking the other way. Um, David, do you want to come in? Well, uh, I, Max actually had, had quite a lot of discussion with officials about the um, equality impact assessment, um, and, and I think uh, we, we would like to think that we'd, we'd uh, had a sort of positive influence on it. I don't think that the, there's anything in the bill that makes situations worse except possibly the legitimization of short-term pavement parking that I referred to before um, I think the question is is does it go far enough which goes back I suppose to the the, the further the previous question and, and Ian's comments okay. um, I, I've got a final question unless uh, uh, the committee's got any more questions my, my really is a general question and you know over the years we've seen a huge shift in in what's acceptable and not acceptable. I mean, drinking and driving, you know, that, that's changed. It is now socially so unacceptable to do that, as it is parking in, in disabled parking slots. And, and, and I don't believe most people even consider it as an option. Do you think there should be a bit uh, tacked on to this bill that, which tries to create that sort of social unacceptability of doing things like parking on drop curbs and not considering people w when people are parking? And, and do you think that's got a role to play rather than just purely legislation and enforcement? I wondered if, if anyone would like to... David. Well, well br briefly, absolutely, yes. I mean, I think we've probably all commented on creating that culture, um, and I don't think legislation is the only thing. However, um, drink driving, not wearing a seatbelt, things like this, legislation drove it. Um, so I think we're looking for to not just have a, have a law that, that, that is enforceable, although that's very important. We're trying to change attitudes and so on. But unless the law is points in that direction, it's really difficult. It's going to be really difficult to create that kind of culture. So uh, absolutely. Ian. Uh, I disagree with what was said. I think um, passing legislation is one thing, but actually implementing legislation is another. Uh, and if this is going to work, it needs effective enforcement, but it also needs that change in culture and attitude. And that will come, will come from effective publicity campaigns and uh, the organisations that have been involved in bringing this legislation to where it is now need to be involved in, with the Scottish Government uh, in developing that uh, publicity campaign. Does anyone else want to add to that? Or? Yeah, Stuart. I think it's also about local authorities seeing this as something that's positive, about getting communities to function more, more effectively. Parking is a problem at the moment, and it kind of brings a lot of issues to head, and it allows you to face up to them and come up with some solutions. The, 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 these are not new issues. And we see these issues occur when you create new controlled parking zones, uh, and people get used to those, so I think people get used to this as well. Okay. And John? At the final point about culture changes, I think there will be culture change required within transport departments within local authorities as well, um, particularly when we begin to look at streets where parking is really tight and difficult. And there has to be a culture change that says this is an issue and we do need to tackle it. Uh, we'll need the resource and the training and the planning to be able to tackle it. It's not just something we can forget about and mm. focal muddle through, you know, it'll all be fine. And I think there is, a, there is an approach uh, like that and I think that's got, that'll have to change as well. And there may well be, and it's be a gradual thing, <laughs> that we may need to look at the impact of planning, on planning of this bill as well. How do we plan our residential estates? We've got a great uh, design policy in Scotland called Designing Streets, but very often I feel it isn't um, adhered to as well as, it as well as it could be, because if it was, we would have residential, particularly residential areas, much better designed around people than around vehicles. And I think that's a, that's a big change that needs to happen within planning. I mean, the committee was in Glasgow uh, on Friday looking at, at some of the things that are being done there. And there was de definitely a feeling that uh, 
designing the streets for modern day use is critical and, and the ability to look back to create that flexibility in the old streets which you've mentioned. So I think that was one of the things that we, we definitely came out with. And also the, the very fact that if you encourage people on buses, you can perhaps uh, reduce cars. So maybe the elephant in the room is about increasing the availability and the reliability of, of buses and trains and, if necessary, uh, all other means so that, so that we reduce car ownership. Uh, it, I don't... Uh, I, th I think we've covered most things this morning. Is there anything that anyone feels I particularly missed, or the committee's missed in in the points they raised? Jo Stuart, you can you can have a quick one. Yeah. Uh, we support the workplace parking levy as as an option for councils, and I think it's important that that gets debated and you take further evidence on the fact of the merits of that. Uh, uh, you, you you've just uh, provoked Richard, who wants to say something. What you're proposing is another tax on drivers and physically, and, and, and I know you, your organisation uh, wants to bring that in. As far as I'm concerned, uh, that's a no-no. I, I ser certainly would not support it. And I've and, had discussions with your organisation about it. And, and, and can I just say that, that, that how appropriate it is to, to leave on, uh, on this session on Richard Lyle's personal view. That's not necessarily a view, collective view of the committee. But thank you very much for coming in and giving evidence this morning. And, and we're very grateful for, for the written submissions that you've made. I'd now briefly allow, like to suspend the meeting to allow, allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you. Right, I'd like to now move back and 
uh, welcome the second panel on the Transport Scotland Bill, where we'll take evidence on the proposal relating to roadworks. And I'd like to welcome Alex Ray, the manager of Scotia Gas Networks, on behalf of Streetworks UK. Elizabeth Draper, Head of Compliance and Regulation for Streetworks o Open Reach, Angus Carmichael, Street Roadworks Commissioner, Mark uh, McEwen, General Manager of Customer Service Scottish Water, David Hunter, who is here from the last committee uh, for Mobility Access Committee. Um, we have a series of questions. Uh, those of you that uh, haven't been here before or didn't see the last session, basically the question will be posed, I will look at you. If you look away and everyone looks away, one of you will get tasked with doing it. But if you want to ask a question, catch my eye or answer the question, and the microphone will automatically go live in front of you when it's your turn. I did remind everyone that I followed uh, the deputy presiding officer's process of wagging my pen. If you're getting to the end of your time, that's just to allow everyone to come in. So please don't ignore it because... Um, I'm not sure what the sanction is when, when, when I cease to hold on to it. But uh, the first question is Peter Chapman. And Peter. Thanks, convener, and good morning, lady and gentlemen. Um, you are the people that tend to dig holes and dig up our streets on a fairly regular basis. And I'm sure you're aware that the bill proposes a number of changes to the legislation governing the regulation of roadworks in Scotland. And I'm sure you have all studied it and are all aware of them. So my question is, what practical impact do you think the roadworks proposals in the bill will actually have on road users? And Who'd that's basically to any or all of you. Who'd like to go first, <clears throat> Alex? Uh, can I? Uh, I'll maybe kick off with um, it's kind of quite a, a, bright, a broad brush statement, but you know, as, as utilities, you know, we're not in the business to do bad roadworks. You know, the, the roadworks we do, we have to do with that. They're, they're, they're being done. For a reason, doing bad road works is it's simply it's not good for business. It's bad for our reputation. It's bad for business. It's bad for um, what it, the, the costs involved in it. So you know we're in the game to do good road works. I think as a whole we have a, a good working relationship within the road working community, both uh, between each or between the, the utilities and how we get on with um, the road works commissioner and and the road authorities. I think that actually works well. Um, there's, there's nothing really in the bill that says it's going to change drastically. There's some subtle changes, there's some subtle pushes into trying to work more cooperatively, work more efficiently, um, and, and on the whole, I, th you know, I think it's actually fairly good for for what we're trying to to uh, what we're trying to achieve. Um, I, I think what I might try and do is bring in um, the utilities first, and then maybe come to uh, Angus to make a comment, if I may, afterwards. So, Mark, Scottish Water. Yes, so certainly from our perspective, the, the um, provisions in the, in the bill, I think, provide a framework to continue the journey of improving the high quality of roadworks, whether it's done by utilities or by roads authorities. So we welcome, the, I think, the establishment and, and uh, some clarity around the role of the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner. I think we welcome the move to um, reinstatement quality plans. Um, there's no particular provisions that cause a concern in terms of the additional approach to um, regulation, noticing and, and penalties. Our perception overall is this will generally just continue to drive up the quality of roadworks in Scotland, which I think currently we believe are to a relatively high standard, certainly compared to the rest of England and Wales. Um, and that's a journey that this, 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 uh, this bill will continue. It doesn't pose a particular threat to us. It's an opportunity to continue to drive up our, our quality of works. Elizabeth. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, it, it is a, an evolution. Um, it, it, there's a few things in there that do improve the situation, but in particular, I think the quality plans is the one I would call out. So that's going to encourage more works to be done right first time. Um, that will uh, prevent, you know, rework and having to go in and, and, and dig the road up twice or have traffic management twice. So that's certainly something I think is beneficial. Uh, but it, it is a continuation of, of what's there. And I think that's probably the right thing, refining the edges as opposed to something completely radically different because we, we are going in the right direction. I think it's about doing more of that. Angus, everyone's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I, I think, first of all, I should perhaps say that the situation in Scotland is significantly different to that south of the border, uh, where we have one Scottish Roadworks Register. We're very fortunate of having, having that. Mm -hmm. In England, I think there are around about 170, and they're very disparate and, 
Alec doesn't know what Elizabeth's doing, what Scottish Water are doing, and so forth. Up here, everyone knows what everyone else is doing on the road. Um, it will undoubtedly improve, the provisions of the bill undoubtedly improve quality and safety, but turning to the, the, the impact on, on uh, the, the public, which I think was the, the main question, was it, it, it will all lead towards reducing disruption and improve, as, as more real-time information comes in, it should improve journey planning time for individuals as well as reducing the disruption and, and getting things right, quality plans, getting things right first time rather than having to return to that site. But certainly, you know, I would have to say, you know, I very much feel I'm amongst friends at this end of the table. It's, it's not as if we're, we're fighting with each other day and daily. David, I'm going to bring you in because everyone's convinced they're all perfect. Does it all work for you guys? Um, thank you for giving, giving me the opportunity to uh, dissent a little bit. Um, obviously, the, the session we've just had is, has been highlighting the, the problem, the parked cars in particular on pavements for disabled people. Um, I've got to say, we, we think roadworks are a serious um, hazard and often obstruction for disabled people. And uh, we don't share quite the rosy picture that's been painted so far. Um, the the so-called red book, the, the guidance that is already there and has already been endorsed by Scottish ministers is actually very good. And we appreciate that most of the uh, most roadworks, whether by utility companies or councils or whatever, um, do pay some attention to this. But uh, on the way here this morning, I took a photograph, for example, of a road sign um, saying diversion because of roadworks that left um, less than a metre of walking space past it, which would stop a wheelchair user, for example, using the pavement. Um, I think probably all of you around your constituencies will see this kind of thing every day. Um, other common problems are uh, ramps usually are put in when roadworks uh, have to block off a pavement and there's a di diversion onto the road. But again, very typically, there isn't enough space for a wheelchair user to get to the bottom of the ramp, turn around and go along the, the, the route provided. So we think that uh, application of the, uh, the very good guidance that already exists uh, isn't good enough and we'd like to see better uh, inspection and enforcement, again, a theme of the previous discussion around pavement parking. Peter. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I need to dissent a wee bit as well. I mean, I, I, I recognise you all want to reinstate all the, your, your uh, road works to a high standard, but uh, the practical, uh, practicality of it is that it, it very often isn't reinstated to a high standard. We've all seen areas of the road that's been dug up and within weeks or months that the the uh, the uh, repair has collapsed and there's a big hazard there on the road for 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 cyclists in particular and for for everybody really so i mean what what is your view on the proposed inspection powers for the, the scottish road works commissioner and their staff do you really think that this will drive an in, uh, you know a, a, a better standard of repair and 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 really m make sure that what you do when you do put it back it is a high quality repair and it isn't going to be needing to be revisited re uh, a few weeks later. I mean, that seems to be the problem. The, the, the road works, the road collapses where the, the, the hole was dug or whatever, and then you have a real issue there. Can we, can, we, can we be confident that the changes in this bill will drive a better standard of, of uh, reinstatement? Angus, that looks to be directed at you. I, I, I certainly didn't mean to imply that road works were perfect by any stretch of the imagination in Scotland. They're, they're, they're not. I mean, I... I have a, a dashboard system which is produced quarterly on a basis of red, ambers and greens. And there's still plenty of red in it. Mm. What I would say is we are better than our southern cousins. But there is certainly remains room for improvement. Mm. And if it comes to, to safety, for instance, there is no evidence that roads authorities carrying out works are any better than utility companies. Mm. And it's probably the case that utility companies are better regulated and generally perform uh, slightly better that, than roads authorities doing that same work. But the provisions in the bill should further improve uh, the current situation in Scotland. Uh, it will be difficult to get it absolutely perfect. Uh, you know, there's a lot of human nature and a lot of different operatives, different companies, different <coughs> contracts and so forth. But I think it will certainly lead to an improvement in both the, the safety 
at roadwork sites, which is, is a big issue, and the quality of reinstatements. And they, they are the two main things. Can the I, safety at roadwork sites and the quality. Yeah. Can I ask some of the some of the other folks in the panel, do you feel that the new inspection powers will put an increased um, demand on your, your teams to, to do the job better than perhaps have done in the past? Um, Mark. So I think just, just to pick up a couple of elements that are in the bill, I mean, the reinstatement quality plans are a key part of that process, I think, in developing a high standard consistency in terms of the quality of works that are carried out. That sits alongside the existing inspection and monitoring programme that roads authorities apply, um, which I think has a role as well and demonstrates generally for many utilities quite high levels of, of um, standard, but still with room for improvement and also the provisions that sit with the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner to take action where there's fundamental failures of um, quality performance. I think they all create a framework that puts added impetus and, and focus on this issue, provides greater powers for action to be taken where there isn't the right action or there isn't the right recovery. Um, and so I am of the view that the framework being presented, building on what we have already, will continue to drive up the quality of reinstatements and the quality of works on roads. Yeah. Um, so I think um, there's, there is the kind of penalty side of things where, you know, if you get inspected and you've not um, done the right thing, then, then there's a natural cost for that to follow and there's some enhancements in the bill for that. But I think one of the biggest wins of the changes in the, in the bill as proposed is that by formalising the need for a quality plan, which will need to be agreed at the utility level with first-tier suppliers, with any subcontractors, it's formalising um, that, that upfront self-checks, a culture of actually getting things right at the very beginning as opposed to failing down the line and then getting a penalty. And I think that's what feels very different about this. It's putting it in the right place. You know, none of us want penalties. You know, Angus probably doesn't want to give a penalty. We don't want to receive a penalty. This, this is putting it right at the front end. What needs to be done? In what order? How? How are we going to check it? Um, and a key thing that we um, have, have implemented is self-coring. So we're not waiting for authorities or, or Angus to, to go in and, and you know, take a chunk of our reinstatement and see if it's right. We're doing that ourselves so that we can proactively find and fix and then feed back into that upfront of what needs to be done um, so that we, we fix it for the future. And I think that's a key, key difference in this. Um, Jamie, I think it sort of leads on to your question there, I think. Uh, thank you, convener, and good uh, morning, panel. I'd like to explore a couple of themes around some of the other things that the bill does. Uh, uh, the first one is around the uh, issue around uh, qualifications uh, for supervisors and operatives on, on site uh, in relation to works being carried out and also reinstatement. The bill, I think, seeks to strengthen uh, the uh, mm. presence uh, of uh, all staff on site, including contractors and subcontractors, that there should be a trained named operative and that those names uh, should be given to uh, roads authorities, uh, including their qualifications and so on and so forth. And this stems from, I think, much of the criticism that, that, that uh, politicians get from representations when there are f specific uh, issues around reinstatement or, uh, you know, certain practices which are um, uh, not not so good. Um, do you think this bill will have any uh, noticeable, tangible difference uh, to the general public in terms of what they see as the quality uh, and the processes by which uh, road works are are, are done by? Um, I'm kind of going to go to Alex because you didn't get a chance to answer the That's other fine. one. Uh, yeah. Um, the. Lost, lost, lost my train of thought there. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, is it going to change us significantly? And I don't think it will. I mean, certainly within within my organisation, and, and it's not because it's in the bill, we already have qualified people on site. You know, there's, there's a couple of things that we do. We do, as soon as somebody comes into the business and, and any part of it, they've got to have some um, basic safety training, basic awareness training, and basic training in, in what they're doing, right? So, they, so we're not going to put... Um, people out on the roads to do works unsafely. So that, mm. that's that's the first thing. Um, as far as having competent, trained and qualified people on the job, we've got that already. 
Um, perhaps what it heightens it more, it, it might just generate a bit more of uh, responsibility to the responsible and, and qualified person on the site to say, you are responsible for your site, it is important that you do it right, and we are measured on it. So, yeah, perhaps it just heightens that awareness a little bit. It is already there. It, 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 is, it is tightening up what is already in place. Um, so in that respect, it's, it's a good thing. And, and yes, it will help to, to, to enhance, enhance that responsibility um, on, on the work. But you know, as I say at the minute, it's, it's not in anybody's interest to put untrained, unqualified people out there. You know, in the interest of safety for themselves and the public, we've got to get that bit right. And in the interest of doing the job right, we've, you know, we've got to get that bit right. You know, we, we're not in the game of putting unskilled, untrained people out there. You know, and where they're not fully trained, they're always working with a competent and trained person. I, I, just before others step in, I think that's a fair statement to make, but I, as others have mentioned, it's not always the reality. And, and let me finish you with a ex short example. I recently dealt with a case of a utility company, I, I won't name them, uh, who were in, inserting um, uh, telecommunications into a pavement and had dug up n numerous streets. streets. Um, I attended the site uh, at the complaint of some local residents who were complaining about access. In fact, it was dipped ramp access to the road and the uh, lack of pavement availability. So I went to check it out for myself. Now, when I got to the site, there was a large number of subcontractors on site. There was no one from the prime uh, uh, operator themselves. Uh, um, it was very difficult to engage with the members of staff there. No one seemed to take any responsibility. There was lots of, you need to speak to my supervisor. And when I eventually spoke to the supervisor, he said, I'm a subcontractor, you need to speak to the ex uh, uh, utility company, and here's their telephone number. There was nobody on site who could account for the health and safety or the actions of anyone. And that, that was a real example of me being on site at mm -hmm. the time. I suspect that happens in other places too. So I think the reality is, is maybe quite different from your right. perception. I, I, you know, I, I would agree that is, that is a, a bad example. That, you know, that shouldn't happen. There should be a person on site that has overall responsibility for that, for that site. And uh, therefore, the, can I ask the Scottish Roadworks Commission, are you confident that this gives you adequate powers to, uh, to enforce uh, the practice or, or to ensure that you're happy when you sign off uh, plans or reinstatement uh, plans th that the bill, uh, as it's currently drafted, gives you enough power to, to give more confidence to consumers? I think, r rolling back to the first part of your question, um, uh, qualifications, generally, round the table here, you have large organisations who have pretty good systems in place. If you go to, I, I imagine the company you're talking about are, are, are rolling out these programmes of telecoms across Scotland currently, and, and there are issues with, with multiple uh, subcontractors and so forth, which, which we are looking at. Uh, the, the, the qualifications element of the bill has been progressed in parallel with uh, there's the Training and Accreditation Group UK looking at how the, the test operatives. Currently, I could go along and, and sit a day-long course, a week-long course, and comes to the test at the end, I could turn to David and say, what, what's your answer, David? Now it's all going to be computerised and a much larger pool of questions such that the, the, the standard of the qualification is also going to improve in parallel with what's proposed in this bill. Um, it, it is true that uh, at times you will come across people, there's always meant to be somebody on that site with a card. And I, I've come across uh, sites m myself where, where people have not been qualified. But generally, if you, if you take uh, OpenReach, they have a lot of uh, single operation vans out there. And any time I've personally stopped, these guys have, have got a card. They, they, know the, they know the situation. But there are, uh, as I say, there are challenges with uh, some of the other telecoms providers right now. Uh, but they are aware of their obligations. They're aware of what they have to do to, to improve. Um, w one thing that will improve the qualifications, the courtesy for, for instance, those with, with a disability when they come across a site, if they are aware of, of what they're meant to do in the way of sign, lighting, guarding, walkways, pedestrian ways, uh, they will be more sympathetic to, to catering for the needs of, of, of these people. Um, Can I ask what you, uh, what you do with repeat offenders? Because one of the, the new parts of the bill is around the submission of, of these uh, reinstatement plans. 
and it says uh, in my notes that the plans must be approved uh, by the Commission um, and that the parameters for approving it is whereby the applicant can demonstrate that they are competent to execute the works properly and has quality control procedures. But the point that's missing is it doesn't take, seem to take into account the historic activity. So if, if you have a, 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 a company who's submitted a plan that seems on paper to be good, but you know in practice have been less than, than forthcoming in the past, are you able to take that into account when approving future plans, or do you have to judge them just on the merit of, merits of the plan that's Cur delivered to you? Currently, wh wh where I come across systematic failure, I have powers to impose a commissioner penalty. As you know, through the bill, the compliance notices are, are proposed, and that will be a, a, an amendment to that system of escalation of it. Where I saw a company uh, routinely fail, I would be looking to take action against that company. Clarify, because I think the point Jeremy makes is quite interesting. It, it, it's the whole issue of a main contractor and then all the subcontractors underneath and the fact that it's trying to hold the sub-sub-subcontractor to account for a contract that is awarded by the main contractor. And Do you feel that the bill deals with this? Because just about everywhere you go now, the, there's a subcontractor somewhere involved in it. The, the legislation puts the onus squarely on Mark, Elizabeth and Alex's shoulders uh, and they have to manage their tier one, tier two, tier three contractors. So so will, that, will, will, will all the subcontractors, does that mean, say, in the uh, just out of interest, Mark, if it was Scottish Water and you had a subcontractor, <coughs> that there would be somebody from Scottish Water on site to deal with the issue? Or is it that... No. It could still be a remote telephone call. So, so not necessarily. I mean, in fact, in many cases, there won't be anyone from Scottish Water. So I take an example of uh, water repairs. Um, we have a, I have a, a team of people who carry out um, burst repairs, um, but we also use supply chain partners to support that, um, prim primarily one partner. Um, that partner will not necessarily have a Scottish Water person on site. Um, they will, however, be subject to exactly the same requirements in terms of the quality of works, uh, the, the ticketing required of the individuals on site in terms of their qualifications, they need to be demonstrated. They'll have sy um, systems of work that we've reviewed and signed off in terms of the quality of the works and the safety of those works. And we will then also uh, have a random, and as a random process, that they may be visited by uh, field service advisors we have who will visit sites and just test and check, are we happy with the quality of, say, the signing lighting guarding, quality of reinstatement. So that, that happens in parallel. Um, but there will not be a Scottish water person on site where those works are carried out. We primarily only use one supply chain partner in the operational world around re repairs, um, so we don't have tiers upon tiers upon tiers of, of supply chain partners. It's primarily one main supply chain partner we use. But 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 it seems to me that, that the most important thing is to make sure that, that the the implications and what the bill is trying to drive at is is part of the covenant contract for tier one, tier mm -hmm. two, and tier three suppliers in their contract. I, I notice you're all nodding. I'm assuming that you're all agreeing to that. Yeah, Alex, and then I want to come to Peter and then yeah, move on you. to John. I mean, I, I agree, agree entirely with, with uh, what, what Mark's saying there. Uh, as the principal contractor, if you like, you know, I'm, I'm talking about SGN works here, you know, we are responsible for those works. It's an SGN site. We're responsible, irrespective of, of who the, the contractor is or the subcontractor is, it's our site. Um, and at, at the various rock and, and area rock meetings that, that I go to and my team go to, we always keep saying, if there's a problem, come to, and you can't get through to anyone, come to me or come to my team and we'll deal with it. You know, we'll, we'll take the issues on board. We'll not try and shirk the responsibility. It's our site, our responsibility. It's up to us to fix it. And, and the example you gave there, absolutely, you know, a dreadful example, shouldn't happen. Um, and, and it's something that we, you know, we, we, we need to take on board. But there's, I don't think there's anyone here that's going to say, no, it's, it's, it's a subcontractor's problem. No, it's not. It's, it firmly sits with us, um, and it's up to us to manage and control our contractors. Elizabeth, I know you're coming in. Maybe you'll get a chance to Thank answer you. Peter's follow-up question. Peter. Thanks, uh, Convener. I, one, of the, one of the new things in the, in the bill, it, it is proposed that uh, you will need to, the utilities will need to state a start and a finish date for any works that you're, you're going to take take uh, forward. How practical do you feel that is? And do you have real concerns about, about how, how you, you would do that in practice? Elizabeth. Yeah. So um, I, th 
think the reality is it, it, it's a start and finish when you're literally on, on site. And so um, by the very nature of that, you know, somebody somewhere knows that's happened. The limitations at the minute of being able to achieve that are um, connectivity and um, potentially having the right IT to say it's done. Um, and so I think I know that this will be subject to some supplementary regulations that will outline exactly how this will work and when it comes into effect. And that's good because right now I don't think we're quite in that place from a technology perspective. But um, I know the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner's Office are working on an app which will facilitate that. There will still be limitations in some areas where there isn't connectivity. Um, but again, I, I think that's being addressed by time stamping when you send the note as opposed to when it's received. So that will help work on those connectivity. But I, I don't see that as an insurmountable thing. I think um, the way that, that this is moving, you know, it's, 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 we, we can um, let the public know where we are quicker. It's possible. The only limitations are technology and connectivity. Um, so it's absolutely feasible, but the technology needs to come before regulations and any subsequent penalties um, can legitimately be in force. Bring in Alex, and then I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, I, I'm going to expand your question a little bit into the whole noticing process. Um, and on the whole, we are okay at noticing. And yes, there's a, a lot of room for improvement. Um, there are there are various areas of, of where we're noticing, and and, and, I, and I'm a great believer that when we're working in housing estates somewhere does it actually matter how much notice we give? And to a certain extent, probably not, because the only people it affects are the people that are in that housing state. And yes, it's important that we work with them and they're aware of, of what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, what access we need to their property. So we need to work with that bit of the community. From the rest of the, the road working community, it probably doesn't really matter. What we, What is more important is that we... Um, coordinate our works and we all work together so and that's and that's part of what the register does it's part of what the, the whole rock process does it's about working together um, obviously when you come to traffic sensitive roads it's far more important that we give more notice there and as I've always said to uh, people in, in my organization if you're working on a traffic sensitive road your best friend in the world has suddenly become the road inspector or the traffic police, because they're the people that you need to go and work with and say, right, it's a difficult road, it's a busy road, how are we going to do it? What you know, what requirements do you need? What do we need to do about pedestrians, access for, for, for disabled? There's a whole raft of stuff in there that we have to deal with, and we need to take more time with it. So that's one part of the noticing. Um, and then the other big bit of it is to try and get as much advance notice of our works. And, and certainly with the next gen, we're, we're currently working on um, some um, clever computer stuff that will automatically upload all our future works into the register so that we can look two, three, four years ahead. And that's not about um, saying, oh, we're going to that street on this 1st of October 2019. It's about trying to say, here's where we're going to work. It's trying to coordinate our works with the road works of, of, of other utilities and probably more importantly with the road authorities themselves so they can look at it and go, ah, SGN are going to be working in that street. They reckon about 2000, early 2021 we were going to resurface that road in, in 2020. So that's the point where we should be coming up and saying, hang on, th there is a big conflict there because what we want to do is switch those around and actually we go on and do our works in 2020 as do Scottish Water, Spen, uh, Open Reach, etc., and then in 2021, the Roadworks Authority come and resurface the road, and all the roadworks are done. Um, yeah, it's it's that big uh, that big thought. It looks great. It's a, it's the old Carlsberg advert, um, but that's where we want to be. You know, this idea of we're there. You know, one day, and then it's it's you know it's, it's straight after it's been resurfaced. That's where we definitely don't want to be. You'll have to excuse me smiling because, of course, I don't recognise the fact that roadworks are done after it's just been resurfaced. Angus, you want to, to comment on that? The, the current legislation for a, for a works commencing this morning at 8 o'clock, it doesn't need to be in the register until 12 o'clock tomorrow, which I think personally is, is nonsense in this day and age of, of communication. The app which Elizabeth referred to and is now available has been since the summer. An operator can go out there at 8 o'clock this morning, press a button on his phone, that's it recorded. And when he goes off site, he presses another button and that's it closed. Uh, so it mu it's much more real time and live. And not only does that allow the roads inspector to, to get to that site and maybe a two hour job, you get there while it's actually live, but it also means that it goes onto our 
a public facing website and it's live information to, to anyone around this table who wants then to do a bit of travel planning. It's, the whole thing becomes much more real time. Okay, John. Thanks, convener. Um, I think around the area of safety and staffing, now my understanding is that the bill is going to require roads authorities to match the same requirements which yourselves and other undertakers have had, and I'm assuming that most of you think that's a good thing, but you can absolutely tell me if you don't. When I, I looked uh, at safety, now as I understand it, the two key things are that roadworks are fenced and lit. And, uh, you know, I have to say I smiled when I read the fencing because what I see is that maybe at four o'clock on a Friday, the workers go off and there's nice little delicate fences beside the hole. And they last for a couple of hours, maybe, uh, until the kids push them into the hole or onto the street or block the temporary pedestrian way, which uh, affects then disabled and everybody else. Uh, or they just get blown over by the wind that night and then Monday. So we've got, a, you know, the, the, the whole place is a mess for the weekend. And then somebody comes along on Monday and starts working again. So it's all very well putting up fences, and I'm sure you're all doing that. But, you know, is there some way we could improve that kind of situation? Who'd like to go on that? Mark? Let me just to respond before we get to the improvement piece. I mean, certainly um, we don't use delicate barriers generally. Um, having lugged some of these things around, there, there's some weight. So we generally have some quite robust barriers put around excavations and the protocol is very clear around the need for those to be weighted down by sandbags or something similar to reduce the risk of either yeah, vandalism or um, high winds affecting those in the first place. We've also started in areas where there's more risk around people trying to access excavations using a combination of the traditional heavy duty bright plastic um, barriers as long as as well as the Harris fencing you may be more familiar with, which also provides a double a double level of protection um, to prevent people from accessing um, excavations at the end of the day, um, whilst um, a barrier coming down can be inconvenient. The bigger issue is preventing people from accessing excavations where there's a risk of injury. So that's that's what we're trying to prevent primarily. Furthermore, also, if there is any um, examples where people see barriers down, we are very clear that people should report that immediately. And we will have, we do have an, an operate a 24-7 response that will ensure people are out to address those as quickly as possible. Um, the issue that in poorer areas, people are less likely to get involved and yeah. phone and things. Yes. Yes. So we end up in the richer areas, uh, the people will phone and complain so that they get their hole gets a fence yeah. back round it again, yeah. uh, but my area doesn't. And right. I mean, I take your point, right. there's different kinds of fencing. I mean, the, the Harris fencing, frankly, does go over very easily. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, I also think sandbags are just a waste of time. Um, they come off the sign. If they're just hung on the bottom of the sign, which is what is normally done, they come off very easily. The sign still blows over. I do like the ones, the kind of plastic ones, which have either water or sand yes. in them. Yeah because that is much less easy to move, but they, um, they're not so high. I, I would accept that as well. So I, d I just think there's, a, there's an issue yeah. around there. I'm not going to go on and on about it, no, but sure. yeah. um, you know, clearly some of the fencing doesn't work. I don't know if any of the others have comments as well. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, so, so, sorry. Um, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. Um, I'd like to hope we can disagree with it. The, the Red Book is very clear in the, the specification of the barriers that has to be used. They have to be uh, of sufficient strength that they will stand, withstand certain winds. <laughs> and the Red Book is also very clear that we should be inspecting those sites on a 24-hour basis. So where you're saying the site's left, uh, as far as work stops on a Friday, we should still inspect that site on a Saturday and a Sunday if we're not working at that site. So we should be inspecting those sites on a 24-hour basis. And again, as Mark says, you know, please, 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 if, if people see it, Give us a phone. We, you know, all our all our barricades have got numbers on them. All our sites should have courtesy boards on them. Phone us up. We'll come out. We've got a twenty four seven operation. We'll have somebody out within, you know, one or two hours, and we will fix it. Um, when you say so, courtesy boards is that is that saying who to phone or who's yep. doing the work? Yes. I mean, I have to say my experience of that is patchy. Right. But I'm not blaming your organisation. Okay, again, that. you know, it, it it it's a mandatory requirement. We should ha or we must have courtesy boards on all our sites, and it should have a clearly number that says. In the event of any issues, problems, questions, here's a number to phone. And certainly in our case, that's a 24 7 uh, operation. Just to help John, Angus, do you, do you issue fines if, if these things happen? There has not been a fine, a penalty uh, issued on the basis of, of, of lack of fencing. 
uh, perhaps that's remiss. I see one of my predecessors is here today. Perhaps it's remiss uh, on all of us that we haven't pursued that particular avenue. But it's something we, we are aware of. And it's, this, is, this, is the, this is the Red Book here. Um, and the, the whole basis of the Red Book involved in the bill. John, have you got any more? Is that... David, do you want to come in briefly? Yes, ju just briefly. Um, I, I mean, uh, our particular interest really, or our main interest, is on the actual duration while the roadworks are taking place rather than the reinstatements, although there are issues there. But um, I mean, as I said uh, earlier, you know, I, I think it is an ev literally an everyday sight to see non compliance with the Red, with the red Book. Um, and it's interesting to hear that, that there have never been any um, any, any penalties is issued around that. Um, I think the bill, going back to the bill, it, one thing that's rather unhelpful is, is it talks about fencing and lighting. There's a section on fence, fencing and lighting, um, which makes it sound a very kind of technical issue. I mean, it's really, from our point of view, it's about a accessibility, and it's about public use, particularly for, for people walking, pedestrians, um, disabled people. And, and as I said, I can't really fault what the Red Book says. Um, it's just that in practice, it isn't... Uh, it, 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 I, I would say it is unusual to find it followed um, correctly. Um, I don't know if we're going to follow on some questions about inspection, um, but that's an issue that I, I think is uh, a real problem, because I under, my understanding is that it's very, very rare for on-site um, roadworks to be inspected by local authorities and I think the charge they can only charge 36 pounds for inspections is my understanding which I can't believe covers their costs so disincentivizes councils from inspecting so it's good and all very well for um, members of the public to report things and I'm sure you know I, I, I sometimes report things directly to people on site and and so on and, and some you know very often people will rectify things there and then but um, I think there needs to be a, a better regulatory and enforcement re regime um, similar again to the discussions we had about pavement parking before um, I, I know there's a whole heap of people coming in, and I'm afraid I'm not going to get them all in. But I know what the next question is, and I know those people who've heard their fingers up will we'll, we'll, we'll get a chance to answer it. So, Richard, could you ask? Uh... Yes, I, <clears throat> well, I am. Uh, we all agree that road works are important, and, and Alec Ray um, spoke about joined up road works. Well, I wish there was, because there's a road in my constituency that would win the BAFTA award for the most dug up road. Gas went in. Then Scottish Water went in. Then the digital company went in. They all had a board. They all had a number. But it was months and months and months. So joined up working. So in written evidence, you opposed um, Streetworks UK opposed the Scottish Road Works Commissioner being given the power to issue fixed penalty notices. Can you explain why you opposed this proposal? And is it because you think you may face penalties? So I'm sure you're going to get your chance now. Right, sorry. Um, I think the thing about fixed, fixed penalty notices is, is it's got to be um, proportionate. It's, and it's not about, is it, is it about punishing or is it about trying to correct behaviour? And, and what we should be about is trying to correct behaviour, is to get the roadworks correct. Um, and I, I take your point about the street that's had gas come in, water come in, uh, telecoms come in, you know, and... To me, I'm, I'm thinking this is sounding really good because what I'm hoping is going to hear next is the road authority come in and resurface the road. And that, to me, is brilliant because that's what we want to try and do. The, the idea of trying to do roadworks at the same time tends not to work because we've all got different uh, methods of working. We've got, all got different um, uh, priorities. So that, that bit doesn't tend to work particularly well. Uh, when, it, when it will work, we'll try it, um, but it tends not to work. So what we try and do is to deconflict the, the, the actual work so that exactly as you saw it, we would go in, uh, water would maybe come in next, um, and telecom... Yeah, but you were, you were saying we're all, we're all... You know, you were painting a lovely picture. Yep. We're all working together. I don't think we are. You know, yep. you, you're all working, but you're all working in your own wee silos, and you're digging a hole... You're digging a hole, and you're digging a hole. Yep. And and the hole could be actually in the same place. So you know, can you not all plan and put in the the the, the gas and the water and the utilities all in the same time? Come in on that, um, just so Alex doesn't feel it's all. Sure. At um, so for 
planned work that sounds like a perfect thing that could happen um and I, I sense, suppose, I thought. we have we have the um register in scotland that we don't have in other parts of the uk that enables for planned work that collaborative approach and believe it or not we do as open reach look where are other utilities going where we plan to and can we coordinate and we do that as a matter of course but of course we've got to remember that there's only a small proportion of planned work for some of us um, and and a lot of the work we do is is sitting in the minor bucket so that's where we give three days notice because it could be a customer connection it could be a blockage um, and also we have a lot of reactive work you know if we get faults or cable theft you know things like that and so I, I think there is absolutely an opportunity to coordinate and the register facilitates that. But there will always be an element of appearing of not to have done when you've got this constant flow of reactive work that, that does exist in the industry and is absolutely necessary to you know connect, connect Scotland digitally and fix gas leaks and, and whatever else is going is on. It, are you for penalties, paying penalties or not? So it depends what the penalty is. So I, I, I see a penalty should be a last resort, and this is, this is what I wanted to come in on. So I, I don't think it's a bad thing we've not had penalties, and clearly I would. Um, but the, the reason I think that is because um, there's so much more that should happen before. So the quality plans we talked about, you know, we should, we should be brought in to discuss what we're doing to improve. It, it's, not, it's not kind of fair to say that we don't get checked at the beginning of the year, we agree a number of sample inspections based on the volume of our work the previous year, and we pay for those up front. You know, as, as, as statutory undertakers in this area, that's what we do. So we fund the inspections and we expect those to come. Of course, there'll be ad hoc ones as well. There'll be third party ones reported by other people. But we absolutely do support inspections and see inspections and we do our own. Um, and like the others, we have a 24-7 service. If something's phone in, we'll fix it. Um, but but I, I think penalties have a place, but I think they're the last resort. If we end up with a penalty and the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner or Roads Authority has to give us a penalty, something's gone wrong. We, we should be collaborati collaborating. We should be looking at improvements and looking to change behaviours. A penalty, it, it should be the last thing, particularly with the size of penalties that have been proposed. And I would hope, and one of the things we've proposed, is a tariff of charges on those. So I think Alec Ray's against, Elizabeth Draper's against. How, what about Mark McEwen? We're, we're comfortable that the, uh, the provision of uh, um, uh, penalties uh, and the like has a place, uh, as, as raised earlier. It's going to be proportionate and it's going to be appropriate. But as a final resort, we have no fundamental objection to that being included in the bill. And I'm going to briefly bring, it, bring in Angus because it's, it's pretty critical that you have yourself. The notices, uh, some people see them as a cost of doing business. I, I view them as an avoidable cost. If, done, if the work is done properly in the first place, there will be no fixed penalties. Uh, what's proposed is a, a small extension to the there are basically four areas just now, and maybe goes on to six or seven. Um, the, the, touching on the, the, the point of working together in the same trench can be very difficult. Your, your plant open reach may go in at this depth, Alex might go in at two or three metres deep, and, and that's a very challenging situation. One little correction, sorry, while I'm speaking. Uh, I said there'd be no penalties applied for, for signage. Uh, maybe not specifically signage, but OpenReach had a, a £50,000 penalty applied in Inverness uh, by one of my predecessors uh, for, for their working. And much of that was to do with, with signing of sites, I believe. OK, we're going to move on to the next question, which is Mike Rumbles. Which carries on from um, fixed penalty notices. And my question really is focused on Elizabeth. Um, in the written evidence from OpenReach, uh, you call for the creation of an independent adjudicator for fixed penalty notices. Why do you think that would be necessary and how might it work in practice? So um, we already have, through ROC, um, the Roads Authority and Utility Committee, a, um, an independent appeal point for other charges. So, so if there's a, a disagreement as to why the charge has been levied, it goes through that process. Um, the, there is a discrepancy with fixed penalty notices that... 
um, in, in the existing legislation in the proposed bill, if you don't agree with the situation, it goes back to the issuing authority. So it's effectively the same person. Mm -hmm. It might go to a slightly more senior person, but usually these are technical issues. And so you need a, a fairly detailed understanding of roadworks to be able to adjudicate. So you end up in the same, the same pot. Now, clearly, we want to avoid as many... Um, debates as possible and things should be as black and white but we're always going to end up with them so so it's to make sure there's a fair and just process really um, and for every other uh, type of charge it, it would go to the Rock uh, process which is well defined and has been around for, for a long time for fixed penalty notices that just doesn't happen it goes back to the same pers person or issuing authority and so that would feel at odds with with a fair process to us and we would we would um, look for something like the rock process for FPNs as well. Mm -hmm. Just wondered what Angus yeah, was, was going to say. I'd be interested here, Angus. I, I think there are parallels with, for instance, parking tickets, where you, in the first instance you appeal that to the issuing authority, and very much so with, with fixed penalties, you're appealing to the issuing authority. What happens after that? If there's change to the process, I'm, I'm kind of relaxed about. Uh, but I think in the first instance you should continue to appeal to the issuing authority. Okay. Uh, let's go on. My, my last question really is, again, back to Elizabeth. Uh, and, and you raised security concerns about the need to provide detailed information about open reach infrastructure to the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner. So can you outline the reasons for these concerns and explain how they could be addressed? Yeah, so this is specifically um, about providing our apparatus data. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do have concerns about providing that in the totality for the whole of Scotland. This is mainly based on the fact that our network is, is national critical infrastructure um, and we have, uh, we have to keep that safe. Um, we, we've spoken with the Centre um, Protection of National Infrastructure um, and, and the Cyber Security Centre uh, UK and, and, got, and asked them for, for advice on how the requirement to do this um, works uh, with what they need us to do to keep our apparatus safe um, and we're waiting for the output of that but in short um, it, any data we hold um, it has to meet certain safety standards to so be encrypted at rest encrypted in transit and lots of other other things um, and so if we were to give our data in its entirety over to somewhere else we would need uh, the same level of uh, security we have in our own systems to be in, in place there. Now, we would prefer that we, we continue to use our own system called Maps by Email that services 1.9 million requests a year for Maps. That does the same job, but it's our own one that anyone can access. But if we did have to go ahead and provide our apparatus, we would want to see some obligations on the third party that would be holding it, so in this case, the Commissioner's Office, um, to keep it safe and secure and for them to be some recourse if they don't um, so that we've got that in place um, and ideally there would be some kind of accompanying code or, or further regulations that would very uh, clearly because this is a complex area mm -hmm. detail what would need to happen to keep it secure so it, it's it's not you know a will to not share our maps we already do that but in a controlled manner in our own system mm -hmm. this is about making sure that we don't put our critical national infrastructure in, in any danger or, or any risk come in and answer answer that we currently have uh, a system called vault where all of Scottish Water's information is on, all of Alex's information is on, Vodafone, Virgin Media, City, Fibre, all of the others, they're all on. OpenReach have always been resistant to this. It's only available to those with access to the register. Uh, my view is, <coughs> it's, it's more a personal view, it's more a commercial decision on the part of OpenReach. DCMS requires them to uh, share information on dot capacity amongst different ones and they say that some businesses would never voluntarily share information without legislation to force their hand. DCMS identified that it was unlikely to be collaborative information sharing about dots without government intervention. Uh, and mm. let's say to my mind it's more a commercial issue than anything else and, and uh, open reach playing a game. Um, oh, controversy. <laughs> Sorry. It's um, all gone so well so far. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yes, it was all going so well. El Elizabeth, do you want to briefly answer that? that? Of course. Um, it, it, is, it is true that in the past we had commercial concerns in this. That's absolutely true. 
Um, and if legislation comes in that requires us to share this, clearly those commercial concerns go away because the legislation requires us to do it. That is not um, the primary driver, and I know I've had this discussion with Angus, and I will get him to believe me at some point. It is risk-based. You know, our, our risk team, our security team are very concerned about this, um, and we've got a, a lot of detail, which I know we've put in our response about what we would need to feel comfortable at this. So it is a quantified issue that we've got. So at the moment, as it stands today, if this was obligated, that's where our main concern is. And without obligations on the third party to keep our data safe and secure, our issues are not addressed. We would still be very uncomfortable about handing it over. Okay, and maybe we should part that there and move on to the next question from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, uh, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, my questions are specifically to Angus. Um, can you tell the committee why you think there's a need to clarify the legal status of the Scottish Roadworks Commissioner? It's an issue which uh, uh, both my predecessors had concerns about, that perhaps they, you know, if anything went wrong, they might have to sell their house to, to uh, settle their, their debts or whatever else. You know, the, the, the contract for the Scottish Roadworks Register, which is a, a, approaching a million pound a year contract, paid for by the, the community, is with me personally. Um, if something went wrong there, how liable am I? I have certain assurances in place from Scottish Government, and I think that unless I transgress severely, I am confident that I would get uh, support from Scottish Government. Uh, I say I know that both of my predecessors had, had uh, concerns, strong concerns, about their, their exposure uh, should something go wrong. And so really just clarifying that. So does that need to be put in the bill or is that clarification I, that can just be given I, I elsewhere? Think, I think it should probably be in the bill. Okay. Um, and in the evidence that you gave as well, you highlighted the issue of permits and lane rentals. Permits and lane rentals. Yeah. Yes, it's very much uh, uh, in place and 57% of the authorities in England currently uh, use permits uh, and or, late, well, two of them are lane rental. Uh, they are now, many, many years after Scotland, they're trying to introduce what they're calling street manager, which is an English street work register. I don't think it will be as good as, as we, what we currently have. To make that work, I think that they require everybody to be in permits so that the transport, the, uh, transport minister has required all, all roads authorities, highway authorities in England, to have permits in place by March of next year. I think it's it's totally unnecessary. It's an extra financial burden, burden on organisations delivering uh, utility services and will, I think, stifle innovation and will remove any of the community working that, that currently exists in Scotland. And what you find, uh, there's been a lot of research into what <coughs> happens in England on noticing and on permits. And they've produced statistics which show the improvements that they will make using permits. We currently in Scotland, under noticing, perform better than the projections in England. And we still feel that our noticing performance has room for further improvement. So we feel that we're ahead of England, England's projections currently, with further improvement quite possible. It's just quite unnecessary. Okay, um, just before we move on to the last question, which is more in one of the things that doesn't seem to be addressed, which I'm sure every MSP has a huge uh, correspondence or dialogue with constituents, is that roadworks that uh, are signed, marked, lanes are closed and left closed over the weekend to protect the workforce, which is nowhere near, and there's no word roadworks going on. With this permits and uh, lane rental not reduce that because it is one of the things that causes huge frustration to people especially on some of the trunk roads in scotland you know and, and we're going to see more work on those you know that the, the road is reduced in in width and and sometimes speed when there's no evidence that it's required and it also undermines the restrictions that should be there when there is workforce there because people don't don't f always believe that they are there I wonder, Angus, if you'd like to make a comment. I think everyone is encouraged, of course, to be as, as, as open with their, their timescales for work. 
as possible. And I think they generally are. There are certainly cases the likes of which you're talking about. But often these cases, uh, and I think on the example that the, the, the Transport Secretary down south cited to, to uh, bring in charges, was itself, I think, concrete waiting to cure. Or parts that aren't available on Friday that might be available on Monday. There, there are often other reasons for sites being open and nobody being on them. I think that's where it comes to information sharing and perhaps signage again, uh, explaining the situation that works are awaiting supplies or are awaiting concrete curing or something to, to, to make it more obvious. Again, my, my public facing website, perhaps something could be added to that. But I human was, nature being, there will always be exceptions that... Well, I always give committee members a hard time if they mention constituencies. So if I say the A9 is a perfect example, park it there and give it to, to Maureen so I don't incur the wrath of the committee. Maureen. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I think, David, throughout the evidence session, you've uh, highlighted some of the main issues around roadworks facing um, disabled people. I just wanted to give you the opportunity to raise anything that you haven't raised so far and whether you think um, that your concerns are addressed in the bill. And I'd also um, like to ask the Roads Commissioner, um, you know, how many times do uh, issues relating to disabilities cross your desk? And if so, what tends to happen with them? Good. Th thank you. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've mentioned, I suppose, the, the, the common problems, and I think I saw a bit of nodding around the room that, that those weren't uh, unfamiliar to you. Um, I mean, one other one I would add is that, uh, talking about roadworks going on longer than they should do, um, it's quite common to see uh, roadworks kind of debris left on the, the pavement um, that's kind of gone missing, sandbags, bits of barriers, perhaps signs often or just the frame of signs and uh, you know these may well come from subcontractors they may well come from local councils as roads authorities um, but there is a lot of kind of roadworks debris littering streets um, which, which is another uh, another issue I mean I think the the, the, the key I think is an in fact uh, is um, I mean there, there, are, there are a number of things that again talking about culture and professional standards and I, I don't uh, I, I you know, I'm not accusing any of my colleagues around here of a, a failure to commit to that, but I think that that there is, I'd like to see the bar raised higher in terms of really uh, being aware of these kind of issues and dealing with them on a day-to-day -day basis through their quality plans and all the rest of it. Um, as I mentioned, I'd like to see local authorities given more incentive to inspect roadworks while they're actually taking place. And finally... Um, I know the Commissioner has new powers in the, the, the bill to carry out inspections, but I think I'm right in saying that there aren't any provisions to enable the Commissioner to recover his costs. Uh, and so I think we're a little bit sceptical that they're going to be used widely, or, or again, there's, there's actually a disincentive for the, for the Commissioner to use those inspection powers um, w when, when it's actually going to be a net cost to the Commissioner to do that. Angus. The cost element, other uh, organisations, the HSE and others, they do not charge for inspections. Um, I would hope that uh, following the, the completion of reg associated regulation that a, uh, a financing regime is, is established by the Scottish Government. Currently, uh, roads authorities do recover their costs of inspection. It's, it's £36. And I know somebody mentioned perhaps that wasn't enough. That is very much based on roads authorities submitting returns to the, the, the working group. That is based exactly on the returns that come in from the 32 councils across Scotland as recently as last year. And Alec chaired the, the group, and it was quite difficult. We, we thought it was too low initially, and we encouraged them to put in other figures and still couldn't get it above £36. Pounds. Um, disabilities, um, they don't... Individual instances don't tend to come to my office. If they do, I would refer them uh, to the, the, the roads authority responsible for that area to, to, to solve. If I became aware of uh, activities which were causing uh, systematic inconvenience to, to those with a disability, yes, I would absolutely get involved in that. Um, 
sorry, was there another bit I was to respond to? Mm. Do you, no, no, you, no, I think that's okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. Well, I think that's all the questions, unless any of the committee would like a, a further question. Right, well, thank you very much, then, all of you, for, for coming in and, and giving evidence this morning. Um, it's been very helpful. Now, I'm going to briefly suspend the meeting. I'm going to ask members uh, of the committee to stay in their seats, and I'd ask the witnesses to um, move, move on, if they may, so we can carry on with the next item of the agenda. So briefly suspend committee to hold their seats, please.